Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Schriever Space Power Forum series. We're really pleased today to have the director of the National Reconnaissance Office, Dr. Chris Scalise, with us. As the NRO director, Dr. Scalise is responsible for providing direction, guidance, and supervision on all matters pertaining to the NRO. He has decades of experience in civil, national security, and intelligent space programs. Back at NASA, he served in many senior program management positions, became NASA's chief engineer, and later became the top civil servant at NASA as its associate administrator. Prior to becoming the NRO director, Chris served for seven years as director of NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. So welcome, Chris, and thanks very much for taking the time uh, to be here today. Really appreciate it. And uh, what I'd like to do is offer you some time to sort of give our audience a little bit of an overview of what NRO is all about. Well, thanks, Dave, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And, and thanks for the Mitchell Institute giving me the opportunity to, to talk today. Um, you know, the NRO has been around for more than 60 years, and for about half of that, uh, we were a secret. Nobody knew who we were, uh, and that was a good thing. So oftentimes, you know, people don't really know what the NRO does. So just briefly, the NRO, throughout its entire 60 years plus of existence, has focused on, de on de delivering ISR from space, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and delivering that information to a broad range of users, uh, all the way from the policymakers to the warfighter to, to uh, uh, first responders and scientists who are looking to understand what's going on in, in, in areas that are denied to us for whatever reason, either for political reasons or because they're, they're uh, inaccessible for, for geographic reasons. Um, and that information helps us to understand what intentions are to help uh, a, uh, a, a warfighter on the battlefield to know what to do uh, and, and where to, uh, to focus their efforts and, and to help in, in responding to natural disasters. Uh, before you get there, you wanna know what the situation is on the ground as well. Uh, so it provides information there as, as we work with those, those fields. And then even uh, our data has been used to support uh, efforts in, in understanding our earth in terms of, of climate change. So it's a wide ranging uh, set of uh, responsibilities that the NRO does. And of course, over time, our, our challenges have changed. Uh, the world changes. Uh, if you think about uh, the 1960s, we could drop uh, uh, film from, uh, from the satellites and uh, in, on parachutes and pick them up with an aircraft uh, and that met the objectives that were needed. That won't work anymore. Uh, and it hasn't worked really since the 1960s. So we've had to adapt and we continue to have to adapt. Uh, so the NRO is really focused on understanding what the environment is, working with our, our colleagues in the intelligence community and the DOD to understand what our threats are, what the requirements are for our information and then being innovative in taking advantage of uh, new technologies in terms of developing technologies for the future, uh, in working with partnerships uh, as we work with uh, clearly the ones that we all understand and know, Space Force and Space Command uh, and our other partners in, in the DoD and the IC, but also with commercial and academia uh, to go off and, and, and focus our activities so that we can address those challenges. Uh, and of course, the absolute uh, ingredient that allows us to be as innovative and creative as, as we want to be is our workforce, uh, having an absolutely incredible workforce that, uh, that is very dedicated and very innovative uh, to lead us uh, into the future and to address today's problems as well. So that's sort of a brief overview of the NRO, and i uh, turn it over to you for questions. Okay, great. No, thanks for that uh, rundown. Um, uh, let's jump into, into some specifics, if you will. Uh, recently, I understand that you and Secretary uh, Kendall came up with an informal agreement, if you will, uh, to rapidly supply timely ISR uh, to folks in the battle space. And uh, Mr. Kendall indicated that this might lead uh, to some co-funded projects. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on just 
what this is all about? Certainly. Uh, yeah, Secretary Kendall and I talk regularly. Um, and, and I would say we, we've had a, a long-standing relationship with Space Force and, and Space Command uh, as we've been going forward and have already been doing and are already doing uh, some projects together. What the Secretary and I talked about is expanding that uh, to uh, recognize that, again, the world is changing. We need information faster and we need to deliver it quicker. Um, and, and we have even more denied areas. We've been operating in a more permissive environment. Um, and that has gone away. So uh, as we discussed and as the secretary said, uh, we're going to tighten that relationship. We're going to work more closely together and, and we're going to find ways so that we can be efficient from a government standpoint. Uh, we can be responsive to, uh, to, the, to the users uh, and we're going to stay close so that we can, uh, we can make that happen uh, you know, very effectively. How about the, the, the co-funded piece? Yes, uh, and, and co-funding things. We're, in fact, uh, doing that today, and we'll continue to go off and do that. Is that going to complicate any of the, 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 the congressional authorization and uh, appropriations uh, uh, challenges that the, the organizations, federal organizations, sometimes have or, or not? You think that, that's not that big a deal? It hasn't so far, and, and I think the reason it hasn't is we tell people what we're going to do. And as long as we keep oversight informed, Congress informed, OMB informed, the department and the IC as to what we're doing and why we're doing it, um, we've had the support, and I think we'll continue to have that support. Great. Great. Speaking of our friends in Congress, Senator King, a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, spoke recently about the importance of synergy between the Space Force and uh, NRO, and we all understand that importance. Uh, in addition to this recent agreement with Secretary Kendall, uh, how else are you collaborating with the new Space Force? Well, of course, I think many people know that the NRO has a, a significant military component uh, as, uh, as part of the workforce. Um, uh, it's roughly about one third military and the largest percentage of that is Space Force. Uh, so that's one area where we have, uh, you know, a very tight coupling. Um, and the good thing about that is uh, those same folks, as they rotate out, will go to Space, uh, uh, space Systems Command. They'll go out into operations and they'll do that and then they'll come back to the NRO and and, and so we're exchanging a lot of information and, and understanding how everybody works. It builds our relationship even closer. At the same time, we, uh, we, uh, we work closely. We've talked about collaborations. Uh, we're working you know, closely with, uh, with Space Force on those collaborations. As I said, we've started it, and we're looking to make that even tighter as we work uh, at the Department of the Air Force level as well. Now, I think that's, uh, Chris, an important piece. A lot of people don't understand that there's so much uh, that, 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 that so many folks from the Space Force are, you know, the, the critical elements of the National Reconnaissance Office. So it's important. I and mean, we switch gears a little bit uh, to talk about the Space Command as opposed to Space Force. Uh, in the last year, there have been several uh, agreements and uh, guidance documents between NRO and U.S. Space Command that have been made public. And one of them is the Protect and Defend Strategic Framework. Could you describe what that document's about a little bit and maybe describe the architecture that's involved? Certainly. Uh, you know, Space Command uh, has existed for a long time. Of course, it's been elevated. Um, so there's always been a relationship there uh, because you know, Space Command uh, is integral to many of the things that we do in space as a nation in understanding what's, uh, what's going on um, uh, there, tracking objects and what have you. So we've had a long-standing relationship. We're trying to now formalize it and clarify certain things. And this particular document, the uh, uh, Protect and Defend, as we call it, uh, establishes the framework for how we're going to operate under various conditions uh, because it, it, it will be necessary for us to coordinate um, and in some cases take direction, and, and we have agreed to do that. We're in the process of developing the, the strategies on how that happens and when it happens and, and under what situations it, it happens. But the most important part of it is the, the formalization of, of, the, of the tight structure that we have to understand what's going on in space so that we operate in a consistent manner, manner 
uh, at all times. We have to remember though that the NRO sits both in the IC and the DOD, and we have to address uh, all of those sets of requirements. So uh, for the most part, it's a coordination effort, but it, sometimes it will be, hey, you need to do this and we will do that. Okay, no, that's great to hear. I, just a, a bit of elaboration, again, mainly for our audience. I mean, you understand this, you, you described a bit of it already, but in the past, NRO operated as its own separate entity. Uh, independent of the combatant commands. Uh, when I say independent, I'm, I'm talking about overall uh, organizational constraints. But now U.S. SpaceCom has responsibility for national security interest 100 kilometers and up. Uh, so the question is, and you talked a little bit about it, but how will the NRO operate during conflict? Uh, will it respond to the direction of the SpaceCom commander um, uh, or more in a coordination role. Uh, could you elaborate a bit? I mean, I, it, that's something we're working through. Because uh, as as um, I, I think certainly you understand, the NRO um, uh, gets its direction from uh, on what to look at and listen to from our functional managers, which are the National Security Agency and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. They collect all the requirements from the combatant commands from the broader DOD and from the intelligence community and and then let us know where the priorities are and then we go off and and manage the constellation to deliver uh, what's uh, what's needed and and uh, and where it is uh, space command plays a role into that and space command certainly has as you said responsibility for 100 kilometers and above and they're looking at what are the threats in space either in space or from the ground to space. Uh, and that has to play a factor into, into what we do and, and how we schedule our systems. So we're working out how do we balance all of those different, uh, different activities. Now, part of what we're doing uh, going forward is we're, we're proliferating our architecture to develop a more resilient architecture, something that is, uh, uh, that is resilient to a lot of things, but principally to the activities that Russia and China are doing. Uh, we all know that Russia and China are becoming very aggressive with, with space weapons. They want to take away our advantage in, in space. Um, so we have to deal with that. And Space Command is focusing on that, and we're, we're, we're working that. But the other thing that that resilient, proliferated architecture gives us is faster revisit times, a more responsive system. So it gives us greater capability. So it gives us more options to deliver what is needed to whoever is needed, and, and you know, and in this case, to the question, to the combatant command. So we'll have more capability to deliver and more flexibility among our systems to get the information that's needed. Very good. Appreciate it. Let's switch topics a bit. Um, uh, prior to the run up here, you were talking that you did a successful launch yes yesterday or today? Uh, forgive me. Today at one a.m. Okay. Okay. One a.m. All right. <laughs> Um, and what we're talking about is, in the past, the NRO uh, used to launch uh, only from either the eastern or western ranges, and now they've launched from New Zealand and uh, soon are going to launch from an airborne platform out of the UK. So could you talk a bit about the reason for this expansion of launch modes, uh, and is this new model going to become the norm? Well, I'll say the new model will become the norm, uh, and and in fact, we have launched uh, several now from New Zealand, and as you said, we'll be launching from the UK. Uh, it's, it's air launched, so uh, we'll be doing that uh, here later this year. And we've also launched from uh, from NASA's Wallops Island uh, flight facility as well. So we've we've launched from three different places than than we we have in the past. Uh, the reason we're doing that is is partially what, what what I indicated earlier. We're proliferating our architecture, so we're letting physics dictate what we need. Obviously, so we still need large ones. They'll go from the eastern range and the western range, but we're also going with smaller systems that uh, that we can proliferate and and improve that revisit time. Having the capability to launch pretty much from almost anywhere in the world gives us great flexibility. It adds to our resilience because we're not relying on just one or two launch bases. Uh, so it allows us to reconstitute if we want to do that. Uh, it gives us 
a greater flexibility because we now have the opportunity to, uh, to sort of pick launch bases. Now, again, it's limited because those facilities can't sure. launch, you know, the, the systems that we can get out of the eastern and western range. But still, it gives us a much greater flexibility to accomplish our mission. And I think it sends a message to the world that, that uh, we really value our partnerships with our international communities. Oh, very good. Now, one of the other major changes at uh, the NRO is your willingness to purchase commercial ISR services. Uh, given the proliferation of some really outstanding capabilities in both the uh, electro-optical and the synthetic aperture radar realms, is the NRO looking uh, towards a future that's similar to the direction that NASA's gone, which is more of a service buyer rather than an owner-operator of ISR constellations, knowing that you're not going to give that that big exquisite piece up, but are you looking toward more commercial services? Certainly, we are looking for more commercial services. We're, we're, we kind of have a motto of buy what we can, build what we must. Uh, but really, what it comes down to is the, the commercial market has really grown, and, and we're seeing a lot of capability out there that uh, the commercial uh, companies are, are providing. That gives us an opportunity to acquire data uh, that's needed by you know the community at a lower cost because we're now not the only user of it. Um, uh, it also allows us to focus on those things, as you said, that are critically important that have either no commercial value at all, uh, but have incredible intelligence value um, that we need to go off and do. And, and oftentimes those are extremely complex systems that uh, uh, would be very expensive to develop and, and therefore, you know, the, the, the lack of commercial uh, interest in them. So it's a really a very close relationship, a symbiotic relationship. It also gives us additional cap capacity, right. uh, as we were talking about before, uh, and, uh, and we're going to take advantage of that. So we're looking forward to our, our relationship. We just recently awarded um, three contracts to, to uh, companies to expand our, our, our geospatial imagery. Um, and that's all going very well, and we're very pleased with that. We also are, are looking to, to bring new entrants, new capabilities on board. So about yearly, we're going we're gonna to go off and, and ask for uh, commercial companies to come in with their ideas so that we can engage early prior to having to award a contract so they can understand what the government's needs are um, and we can understand what their capabilities are so that when it comes time to go off and, and have uh, a contract like we have for uh, electro-optical imagery for radar, they'll be ready and we'll be ready to, to go off and do that. So we're looking to get uh, you know, additional phenomenologies. The first one we did was focused on radar uh, and, uh, and then we're looking you know, uh, next year or this year uh, as to what we're going to go off and do. And we'll announce that in the fall as to what our next uh, next area of interest is. No, that's great. I, and I think that, uh, again, to the to the public, it, it, this is the, the whole issue of access to commercial space is becoming more and more clear in terms of its value using the example of what's going on in Ukraine and what's being released in terms of overhead imagery that's accessible commercially. So I think it's get people to open their eyes a bit in that regard. Now, speaking of commercial providers, um, as you just described, uh, NRO and certainly National Geospatial Agency um, uh, are, are picking up and buying these services and products. Uh, question on, with the stand-up of the Space Force, um, and it'd be interesting to get your perspective, understanding uh, you're not the Space Force uh, CSO, but shouldn't the Space Force also have the opportunity to contract for these commercial services directly to be able to ensure that they can provide as a component to a combatant commander the necessary ISR rapidly? What, what are your thoughts on that subject? So um, the, the, the way it's set up is any organization can come to the NRO and, and acquire 
commercial services. So we're, we're available, and that's intentionally done, that it's uh, that the NRO will serve as the as the service provider for that. Um, and further, we, we're trying we're putting it into our data streams so that they can pull so that any organization can pull off that data through their standard uh, you know connection to to uh, ISR data. So it's a it's very quick for anybody that that has access to those systems. If you don't, um, you know we we work to to provide you know uh, any access to that. So. The mechanism is there already uh, for for organizations to take advantage of. Uh, the Space Force is looking to make sure that they're doing a study right now, which I think people are aware of, on, on ISR in general. Uh, they will find out if we need to expand that uh, or if it's fine as is, and then we'll adjust or we'll adjust as a community, as we talked about before, we're going to coordinate. Uh, will adjust uh, as appropriate as we get the results from that study. Well, so it sounds like what you've done is established a push system. Exactly. Um, uh, having been involved in uh, Desert Storm's planning and execution, as well as operation uh, Enduring Freedom at the very opening stages, uh, it wasn't like that. Uh, and you, you, the the delays involved were were significant. So it's great to hear that you're, you're capitalizing on technology to push that information out to the user so that you eliminate that delay. Uh, that was a huge problem. Absolutely, and you mentioned it earlier, and I think it's really important. Commercial gives us the, commercial data gives us the ability to share more and faster, right, without revealing technical means, but providing the information that, that the community needs, right? Uh, the warfighter may not need the exquisite right. imagery, but they need right. to know what's yeah. what's there, and commercial gives us that opportunity. Yeah, I to used to try to make that case. When you're looking <laughs> from a battle damage assessment perspective, I don't need near seven. Yes. I just need to know whether the weapon hit the target or not, which is a much different level of, uh, of information. Now, Chris, many would argue that uh, the space economy is still maturing. Uh, that mixture of uh, private investment, venture capital, and uh, new suppliers, it makes for a market that's really difficult to predict. Uh, given that reality, what, what kind of steps are you taking to ensure that the no-fail missions of the NRO are, are successfully executed? Well, that, that's the, uh, the, the, the balance, right? Buy what you can, build what you must. And the no-fail missions are the build what you must. Um, we, we have to have that so that policymakers and warfighters can rely on that, that system. We're building the robustness into the system, the resilience into the system to assure that we can deliver that. Commercial plays a role in that, of course, but, um, but, uh, but we have to provide that capability and we're in the process of continuing to do that. Oh, very good. Okay, I tell you what, why don't we... Uh I think it's Im Im important to get uh, uh, questions from our audience. So let's jump in here and see what you all have on uh, on your mind. Um, we'll take this first question from uh, Matt uh, Virich. Uh, Chris, do you think NRO is adopting commercial space for services fast enough? We just kind of talked a bit about that. Any issues that you'd like to identify that need to be overcome from either the government or industry sides? I think from a commercial services side, um, we're working well together, certainly with, with uh, uh, the process that we've set up where we can now work together early on before we have to, to go off and, and establish a contract will help us overcome any of the, the obstacles. And each company is a little bit different uh, so each relationship is a little bit different. That sort of depends on the provider and, and the capabilities that they're providing. <clears throat> we certainly want to take advantage of those, but it may require us to make adjustments and, and it may require the uh, provider to make adjustments. And the goal is that it's not onerous to either side. And, and I think that's one of the things that we have to recognize in, in utilization of commercial. Uh, we trust the commercial provider um, and we can't change the way you do business to just 
satisfy our needs. Um, at the same time, you have to recognize our needs and maybe make some adjustments. So we both have to make some adjustments. And if I could expand it a little bit, when we talk about commercial at NRO, it is definitely services as we were talking about. It's, it's that, but we also look for the commercial buses that are being developed by a number of companies. Uh, as we're seeing more proliferated communications architectures, we're seeing very capable buses being developed. And we're gonna take advantage of those as well uh, because that's gonna help us reduce the cost of our constellations and allow us to, to do what we wanna do. And the same method applies. Um, those buses were de developed for a certain capability. Um, we need to adapt and we may need to adapt those a little bit. But the, the, real, the real advantage of working with the commercial uh, community is to recognize that they have a very valuable product. We have, a, have a, a very important need and we need to compromise on how we do it and minimize the amount of disruption to either party in order to go off and, and take best advantage. And, and to achieve best advantage. Yeah, very good. Um, let's. Uh, I see that uh, Brian uh, Everstein has a question. Uh, go ahead, Brian. I think if you're talking, we can't hear you. Oh, sorry, just, just unmuted. Thank you so much for doing <laughs> this and taking my question. Um, to go back to the discussion about your relationship with Secretary Kendall and looking forward, in uh, his discussion of operational imperatives, he focuses on moving tar target engagement at scale and has said that the NRO is doing some interesting things in this area that the Air Force could work on with the NRO. Can you expand a little bit about how the NRO can assist the Air Force with moving target engagement? Well, you know, we, we've been working, in, as we said, you know, in, in an uh, ISR for, for over 60 years. So we have a lot of experience that, uh, that, that we can bring to bear. Uh, on that, and and we're working very closely with with the Air Force uh, and the Space Force uh, on how we go about doing that. How do we take what we've learned and what capabilities we have uh, to solve a, a very urgent problem? Uh, there's a study that's that, that's going on right now that we're doing jointly uh, that's going to inform how we move forward on that. Uh, that is not yet completed, but it it's going well. And as Secretary Kendall said, and and uh, and and I certainly agree with. Uh, we're making you know the the we're moving in the right direction, and we recognize that we have to work together in order to develop that that capability uh, at scale that we're going to need as we work in more denied areas. Thanks, Brian. How about uh, Justin Pearson? Can you hear me? Yes. Appreciate it. Thank you for the talk. It's uh, very informative. Um, my question is, is the NRO prioritizing offensive capabilities and space power like radio frequency jammers, lasers, so that we can avoid the problems that the hypersonics world is experiencing where we have little to no offensive capability and we're just now becoming to uh, research that? Well, of course, we, we, we work to assure our systems are, are robust and, and resilient. Uh, our focus is on, on the, the ISR uh, portion of the equation. So we work very closely with, uh, with Space Force uh, and, and Space Command as to how we're, we're going to go off and, and deal with, uh, with uh, you know, threats. But clearly, we, we have to have the ability to, to, uh, to be robust against uh, uh, any reasonable threat. Thank you. That, that, um... That's encouraging because it's like the this the spectrum of EM spectrum directed energy weapons is all coming into one. It's it's not it's not atmospheric flight and intra-atmospheric flight. It's all becoming one. So that's what you guys are working on is 100%. I believe the direction that we should be going in. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Frank Wolf. Hello? Oh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Okay, great, great. Um, yeah, I just, uh, in terms of the uh, the uh, commercial radar contracts that the NRO, I guess, uh, awarded back in January uh, to Airbus and Capella Space, ISI and Predisar and Umbra, I just wondered, um, 
Is that informing the current uh, space-based radar work uh, that you're doing with Space Force? And um, just in terms of space-based radar, uh, could you just uh, give us some on, well, you've already spoke about moving target indicator, but just in terms of your own thoughts on, on how much this is needed or if you think that there's any other way in terms of the NRO being able and Space Force being able to do it with, with what you've got up there now, um, obviously space-based radar could be a, a, a fairly expensive program. So um, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that and, and any thoughts you can give us maybe on how, how the development effort is, um, is going and whether there are any uh, delays or anything like that. Well, certainly, uh, you know, space-based radar is, is critical um, for uh, anything that we do. Um, uh, the Earth gets cloudy at, at times, and uh, and and radar, you know, certainly gives us a, uh, an advantage there. So, so clearly, radar is, is absolutely critical to any any ISR uh, activity that one would do, or, or wanting to understand what's going on on, on the ground. Um, so, commercial plays a role in that. National systems play a role in that, uh, and and we're evaluating all of them to, to inform our, our decisions as we go forward on, on MTI or, or any other, or moving target indication or any other, any other activity that, uh, that, that would involve our understanding of what's, what's happening on the surface of the Earth. Okay, Chris, we've got one here uh, uh, from uh, Sandra Irwin. Um, you mentioned the recent launches from New Zealand with Rocket Lab. These missions were described as responsive space because they were launched back to back. Why is responsive space important to the NRO? Do you foresee this will be needed in a conflict? And how can you make satellites more standardized so they can be built faster? Thank you. Now I know there's three questions. <laughs> there's a lot. If you forget, I'll get I'll I'll repeat them for you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. All right. Thank, thanks, Sandra, for that. Um, so uh, yes, I mean uh, I, I mentioned earlier that we, we were looking to proliferate our architecture so that we can have resilience, but also provide additional capability. Uh, and recognizing that we need to do that, um, you, you want to have uh, you, you have to have systems that are affordable, um, in, in, at least in space terms, affordable. Uh, that that tends to mean we 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 need to work uh, with with spacecraft that are, for all intents and purposes, in, in the space lexicon, commodities. And, and that's where we have really engaged with the commercial spacecraft bus developers. Um, and there's a number of those, uh, those companies out there uh, that are develop the, developing them for these, uh, as an example, are developing them for these large communications uh, systems, the low earth orbiting communication systems that that we're seeing, you know, coming uh, coming online. So we're taking advantage of, of not only their buses, but what they've learned in, in order to go off and do that, so that we can make systems at a reasonable price point, so that we can proliferate those architectures, so we can deliver, you know, more capability, and we can deliver, you know, a more resilient system um, to uh, to protect things. Doing that. Uh, also results typically in, in uh, slightly, or well, not slightly, in, in smaller satellites um, that can be launched from a, a larger uh, set of locations. <clears throat> New Zealand, Wallops, the UK, <clears throat> as well as other places in, in the United States. So taking advantage of that also gives us the opportunity to, to have the ability to reconstitute should we lose a capability either Due to a mission failure, or uh, as you suggested, you know, in, in a conflict, if if we should lose them uh, due to some adversary action that would would take them out, we now have more places to go off and and uh, uh, and launch from, and and therefore reconstitute the the constellation. So it all it all plays together uh, in, in how we're working to uh, to develop those uh, those constellations and develop the capabilities that the nation and the world needs. 
Hopefully that answers the question. I think I got it. You, you did. You might want to touch on the last one, and that's how can you make satellites more standardized so they can be built faster? Okay, well, that's taking advantage of the commercial uh, again. Uh, that's where where we're, uh, we're working with commercial industry, taking advantage of these, these satellites that are being built in large numbers. Um, we're actually using those in, in many cases, or we're learning from those as to how we can adapt some commercial practices to, to government systems so that we can make all of our systems uh, more efficient, uh, more affordable. Great, here's one from Caitlin Lee. As a former NASA senior leader, what are some of the lessons learned that you've experienced over there that have proven helpful to moving the NRO forward into new things like proliferated architectures and multiple launch providers? Um, well, you know, NASA, you know, does particularly on the science side, <clears throat> you know, launches a number of, uh, of satellites that do a whole bunch of things. You know, look at the Earth, look away from the Earth, <laughs> uh, and go out to the planets. Uh, so, launch is certainly an area where uh, there's a lot of experience, and and at NASA, they take advantage of a, a number of international capabilities. So, we've brought some of that. I have to say the NRO was already there, um, but uh, you know the NASA experience uh, does help to enable a lot of those uh, those capabilities. And we work together to to uh, to qualify launch vehicles to understand what the launch vehicles are and launch launch capabilities are, are around the world because we all use uh, launch uh, clearly. Uh, and NASA has a wider portfolio of. Of, of capabilities. Just recently, they launched the James Webb Space Telescope out of Karoo on an Ariane. So, so there's a broader experience, but we can certainly take advantage of that, and, and we do. Uh, when it comes to satellites, uh, NASA has typically worked in the, in the small to, to medium class. Uh, so bringing a lot of that understanding uh, is, is helpful. And, and I would say also experience with the commercial world um, NASA started exploring that in the in the early um, '90s, really, um, with uh, with uh, environmental satellites, and has continued to do that. And we're also taking advantage of the lessons that NASA learned. So, uh, you know, the space community is relatively small. We all kind of work together and understand what's going on, and we learn from each other. Uh, fortunately, NASA has a has a uh, responsibility in its charter to share that information, you know, broadly, uh, and uh, NRO is a beneficiary of that as well as commercial companies and and other spacefaring uh, organizations. Super. Here's one from uh, Ari uh, uh, Burrito. Uh, sorry if I mispronounce that, but what are the NRO's thoughts about its role? in cislunar space and other areas as countries look toward the moon and beyond? Yeah, cis cislunar space is becoming very important uh, to the nation, uh, particularly as we're seeing other nations that don't necessarily have the best interests of, of our country or the world uh, in, in, in their uh, objectives. Uh, and we're in the process, uh, along with others, uh, in working to understand what, what exactly our role is going to be in, uh, in cislunar space. Uh, space. So that's still something that, that, that we're working on. I don't have an answer for you right now, uh, but perhaps in a, in a few months to a year, we'll, uh, we'll have a much clearer understanding of what the roles and responsibilities will be uh, for the NRO and other organizations in cislunar space. I see that uh, we've got another hand up, uh, Courtney uh, Albin. Courtney, over to you. Hi, yes, uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the earlier discussion of um, the ongoing study with the Space Force and the Air Force on um, ISR. I, I know there's um, some pending decisions there and that work is is still happening, but, but based on what's been kind of the work that's been done so far, um, do you foresee a major change in the NRO's role in this mission? Um, and is there, you know, relative agreement among you know the the stakeholders on on where this should go, can you talk a little bit about kind of of, of that? Well, I certainly don't see a, any major shifts in in NRO's uh, role. Uh, we provide the you know the the overhead uh, ISR seems I'm using that term an awful lot, uh, but the overhead reconnaissance 
uh, that's that's used by by the nation, and I, I don't see any fundamental changes in that, and I certainly haven't heard of any indications that there's a, a fundamental change in, in that set of responsibilities. Okay, here's one from Kathleen Markey. Um, would you please comment on the ramifications of China and Russia building their own space stations and Russia leaving the International Space Station, and if NRO has any response? I don't think NRO has any response. That's more a <laughs> that's more a NASA question, um, and uh, you know all I know at this stage of the game is probably the same as you. What I read in uh, in, uh, in 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 the blogs and uh, and the and the press. Um, all right. Uh, now I normally uh, don't take a anonymous uh, questions, but here's a pretty good one. Does your philosophy of buy what you can? build what you must, apply to software acquisition under your purview, or do you support funding breaking apart COTS, GOTS products to only take what you want? <laughs> oh, that's, that's a pretty complicated question. Uh, so the, the, the first part of it, uh, the answer is yes. I mean, um, if there is a software capability out there that, that we can use, um, Definitely, we're gonna we're, we're gonna buy it, and and certainly we we do. You know, it just depends on where you look in in the system. I mean, it can be as trivial as you know using Microsoft Word, um, you know, our, our word processors. But clearly, you're talking about things that are much more complicated than that. Um, and, and the answer is yes, we we, we do want to do that. Uh, one of the challenges that that uh, I think we all face is um, uh, large ground system software development projects. Uh, and uh, we face those challenges as well. And, and it's an area that, that we're really working to, to become better at. Uh, taking advantage of existing systems is, is, is really important. Uh, sometimes I recognize that that does mean that, that, that uh, COTS and GOTS products, uh, commercial and government uh, developed products, uh, do need to be broken up in order to to meet uh, the demands of a of a capability, um, but we kind of leave that to the developers. But I, I I think you're you're touching on a really important point, which is as a community we we need to work to do better in our development and delivery of uh, of large software projects, because we see lots and lots of places where we have fallen short. Uh, delivered late or delivered over cost, and uh, and we simply have to do much, 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 much better in that area. Uh, here's another good question from an anonymous attendee. I don't know why you folks don't put your name on here, but um, I'll ask it anyway. One of the things I've seen in recent years is the interest of the commercial sector in having protection by the Space Force Space Command or Space Command, given the vital importance of NRO assets, does NRO fall under that protect and defend umbrella of Spacecom, or does the NRO provide for their own protect and defend capabilities? Well, as with anything, I mean, we have the protect and defend framework, as, as we talked about. Um, we work closely together. Uh, we have to provide a certain degree of capability. We can't rely entirely on on others for uh, our our safety of operation, uh, but uh, fundamentally we work very very closely with uh, with Space Command uh, for space domain awareness uh, and for activities that that uh, that we will uh, you know do in space. So it's a collaborative effort is probably the best way to answer that question. Now here's another one that's sort of related. The NRO has a reputation of rapid acquisition in the Congress. Um, I guess it's more appropriately stated, the NRO, uh, with respect to Congress, has a reputation <laughs> of fairly rapid acquisition. Congress certainly doesn't. Um, what best practices does NRO do that has led to this success in getting systems up on time? Well, I think one of the, 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 the I would say that what the NRO has uh, and is fortunate to have is it's a small, flat organization so decisions can be made relatively quickly. From a program manager to me, typically is one, two, three at the most levels 
uh, of uh, of difference. And seldom do decisions have to come come to my level. They 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 can often be de de determined at at the lowest level. So that's the other is is we give uh, you know a fair amount of flexibility and authority to the uh, to the program managers to implement their particular mission. Uh, I think another area that that really helps the NRO is we have responsibility really from from R and D to concept to uh, uh, development to acquisition to operations and ultimately to to uh, end of life. So that gives us the opportunity to see at each phase um, where there are good things that are happening that we want to go off and enhance where there are uh, problems that we need to go off and fix. Uh, and it also gives us the opportunity as we're progressing through those various phases, as we learn something, to make an adjustment, uh, to make an adjustment very quickly so we can make it as we're in the process of development or we're in the process of, of acquisition uh, or, in the pro or even, even perhaps you know, in, in the process of build. Um, so that's, that's you know, certainly an opportunity um, we also you know, have a, a really great workforce um, that um, is is diverse. Uh, it, it represents our, our country, but it's also diverse in terms of thought. Um, clearly, we, we have what everybody knows. We have the military and we have the civilian workforce. They bring in different ideas. The military rotates out, so it brings in what are the new challenges? What are the new perspectives? Um, and the same happens to, to some extent with the civilian workforce. So having a highly motivated, very diverse, highly intelligent workforce um, that is constantly bringing in new ideas also helps us to, to, to do that. Um, and, and then I would say that same workforce, uh, because of, of, of their focus, has allowed us to demonstrate to Congress and to demonstrate to, uh, to oversight um, that you know, we're good stewards of the tax, taxpayer dollar. So we have had, you know, one indication of that is, is we have, you know, had a, a number of clean audits, 13 clean audits in a row. That gives people confidence that we're managing the, the money as well, correctly. So I think those three or four things that I mentioned are, are really what allows us to, uh, to, to be successful in our, in our acquisitions and our performance. Excellent. Here's one uh, from an uh, old friend, uh, Jim Armour. Oh, yes. uh, does the NRO plan to use commercial vendors for ISR data exploitation, similar to the growing use of commercial spacecraft systems? Well, first, hi, Jim. Nice to hear from you again. Um, the, uh, that, that question is more towards NGA. NGA buys those services, not, not so much the NRO. Um, so I guess... I will defer it to, to, to NGA, but great question. Here's one from Laura Winner. Do you see any role for the NRO in space traffic management? Yes, I understand that commerce is the lead, but you have the eyes. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very interesting question um, and something you know, that uh, you know, certainly we're, we're a participant in because we care very much <laughs> about what's happening in space uh, and are, are uh, very much engaged in that. Uh, but whether we'll, we'll have a, uh, you know, a specific role to monitor space, uh, which is what I think you're getting at, uh, is really TBD at this time. And from Stan Rosen, are there NRO innovations in acquisition methodology that you think other federal space organizations should adopt? Uh, I, you know, we we don't really have any anything that's that's terribly unique uh, in terms of authorities that, that we can go off and and uh, and employ. But what we what we do have is is what I said is is that flat organization, which I think others can do to, to, to some extent. Uh, the, the, the ability to, to, to look from you know, the very beginnings of an idea to the, to the ultimate use and, and end of it um, is definitely useful in having a motivated workforce. Uh, I think all of those things are, are, are possibilities that, that can be, uh, that, that, that each organization can, can try and do. Um, 
and uh, really beyond that, it's, it's it's really hard to say that that there's anything you know um, specific that I could give out here. Um, uh, our contracting mechanisms are largely the same, so that's that's pretty much much what I would say. Uh, here's another interesting one: Does the NRO address or consider current or potential industrial base issues? with key component providers for your space systems? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, 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 the industrial base and the space industrial base in particular is something that we think about all the time. Uh, you know, where, where is there a possibility for a gap uh, in, in, in capabilities? Um, and, and we work, you know, we work with the, the, the Space Force, Space Command, um, the DOD, other government agencies. To, uh, to understand what the, the industrial base sector looks like uh, because that, that allows us to do our job. And, and I, I think we, you know, we all know right now that the pandemic has, has indicated that there are frailties in our supply chain. Uh, we're reading about it every day with, you know, with semiconductor chips, right, um, that, that we really need to focus on. And we're really thankful for the CHIPS Act, which is really going to help address, you know, the, some of the the, the items that have been identified in, in our supply chain for, for microchips. Um, so yes, we're working very closely with, uh, with other government agencies. We're very concerned about this. We work with our industry partners on it as well. So yeah, it's, it's a really, really important part of everything that we do. Okay, here's one from uh, Michael uh, Morrow. In your experience as NRO director, how has the recent creation of the Space Acquisition Council improved space acquisition? Well, it provides a forum for uh, another forum for us all to get together and and see what's uh, what's going on. And uh, uh, you know, from that standpoint, it, it's it's a it's a really great uh, opportunity to uh, coordinate and and figure out. You know who is doing what, and and also to share best practices as as we uh, as we develop things, and and having you know Frank Calvelli in there is is just great because he he brings a, a wealth of experience uh, in uh, in space acquisition and operations. So so I think it's 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 a good thing, and and uh, it's going to just make the uh, space community better. Uh, here's an interesting one from uh, Justin uh, Pearson. Uh, a lot of thought is put into preventing space debris, but what would be the challenges facing the NRO after a modern day space engagement where debris in LEO has increased significantly? Oh, well, of course, we, uh, we have lived that a couple of times, you know, most recently with the, uh, with the irresponsible Russian act of, you know, shooting a, one of their own satellites, admittedly, out of, out of the sky and, and creating a lot of debris. Uh, what it means is that, uh, you know, we, we have to pay a lot more attention to uh, our constellations, particularly those in the, the area where the debris is. And it doesn't just stay in, in, in the, the plane or the, the, uh, the, the orbit that, that uh, the, the, uh, the attack occurred in. So it's something that we really have to worry about. And what, in the worst case, what it results in is we have to have a lot more maneuvers in order to uh, deal with, with it because uh, that, that debris could, could be damaging, uh, assuming we can track it. For the debris we can't track, it, it could be causing you know, damage to, uh, to any one of our, our systems that are on orbit. Uh, you know, the Russian uh, act you know, put the space station at, at risk. Somebody asked that question earlier. Um, so any any debris causing event is is a reason for concern, uh, and you know uh, what we want to see is responsible action by everybody that operates in space to to minimize debris uh, and uh, and deorbit those things or put them in and uh, put put uh, derelict uh, systems before they become derelicts in a storage orbit if we can't de safely deorbit them. Okay, here's one from uh, Matt uh, Sanchez. Dr. Scalise, Delta 9 at Schriever Space Force Base has taken on the role of training and developing guardians in the realm of orbital warfare. What role, if any, can the NRO play in streamlining or aiding the Space Force's role as an organized, train, and equip organization? 
Well, you know, we're we're working closely together. Uh, I think you know the most obvious way, uh, most obvious ways, are uh, our coordination that, that we're doing on a, on a regular basis, but between the leadership, uh, and then the exchange of of uh, personnel. Uh, a, a large contingent of the NRO workforce is is Space Force our Space Force Guardians. Um, they will be there for a certain amount of time and then rotate out. So that gives uh, an opportunity to, to share not only what the NRO does with the rest of the Space Force, but as they rotate in to share what the rest of the Space Force does with the NRO. So uh, we, we really build a lot of interaction there. Uh, and then, um, you know, there's the, the war games and the tabletop exercises, um, since you're talking about, table, uh, about Delta Nine, where we work together uh, to understand various scenarios and what would our actions be, you know, given those those uh, conditions? Uh, so we we have a number of, of places where we're working very very closely together, uh, and we have a number of, of formal ways. Uh, the the rotation that I mentioned of of, of guardians uh, into and out of the the NRO, the uh, coordination uh, at uh, at all levels that we're that we're working at. Uh, and in the war games and tabletop exercises that we routinely participate in. Okay, we've got another uh, live question from uh, Gerald uh, Phoenix. Gerald? Good morning, can you hear me? Outstanding. Well, uh, thank you for your time, but uh, given recent developments on the international stage to include the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict and uh, Chinese aggression towards Taiwan recently, um, what current lines of effort, whether it be coordination or acquisition, do you think will most improve the NRO's ability to support its customers in future crises? Well, I mean, I th the simplest thing is we have to keep on doing our mission. Uh, we have to stay in mission and we have to continue to deliver the information that's, uh, that's needed uh, by our partners. Um, uh, longer term, uh, we need to adapt to the environment, and I believe believe we're doing that. Uh, we, you know, we're we're launching, you know, the proliferated architecture for resilience and capability. We're launching more capable systems, uh, uh, employing different phenomenologies to to thwart uh, denial, uh, either by camouflage or or other means, um, so that we can do it. We're diversifying our our uh, capabilities and relying, you know, more heavily on on partners like uh, you know the commercial industry um, uh, that that have systems up there that that allow us to share data, you know, more readily than than one could otherwise. But also to to enhance our our capabilities uh, in terms of providing revisit uh, as an example, and you know, increasing our relationships with our international partners, as we demonstrated just this morning with launch. Um, but also, you know, just in general, as, as we work more closely with our with our international partners. So all of those things together will are allowing us today to do things, but will will allow us to grow into the future and, and be able to to continue to, to deal with the threats as they develop. Well, I think that's a great way to uh, to finish up this segment. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our uh, Space Power Forum. Uh, and uh, Chris, a big thanks to you for taking the time out to speak to us and our, our audience. And so to you and uh, everyone out there and uh, our audience, uh, I'd like to wish you a great aerospace power kind of day. So Thank you very much. Thanks very great. much. Thank you. you